Good afternoon and welcome to Catskills Commerce. I'm Ray Pucci and as president of the Delaware County Chamber of Commerce, I am honored to work with the most optimistic and energized people I think I've ever known, business leaders, business staff. Uh, throughout the Ca Delaware County and the Catskill Mountain region and together, together, we help move our local economy forward. The Chamber believes that prosperous businesses support prosperous communities. And in these days, I like to say that the Chamber believes that prosperous business, uh, prosperous, um, healthy communities start with healthy businesses. We support our entrepreneurs by advocating for public policies that create an environment in which private enterprise may thrive. We promote our region as a great place to live, to visit, to learn, to work, and to play. We create programs that enhance our communities and improve our quality of life. We believe in collaboration, and we believe that the surest way to success is a partnership among business, government, community groups, and education that is mutually beneficial and based in respect, trust, and honesty. Finally, the Chamber believes in the potential of this region, our residents, our institutions, and all who call this special place home or who have an interest in our collective success. That's the message, that's the purpose of this program, to continue to spread the news that we remain a vibrant and diverse place here in the Catskill Mountains. Well, thanks for joining me this afternoon, folks. It's been a few weeks since I've been on the air. I'm feeling a little rusty here behind the, behind the WIOX studio board, uh, but we'll manage through this. A couple things that are going on. I, I think we have a really fascinating program uh, planned for you this afternoon. In a few minutes, I'm, I'm thrilled to introduce to you a couple people who are uh, working, again, it's about collaboration, right? Uh, working to hopefully launch a Montessori school in our area. I never thought that I would at any point in my life say that, but uh, they're making great headways and um, we're gonna talk about what's happening there with a, Monte a Montessori school perhaps opening in Bovina as soon as this fall. And a little bit later on in the program, I'm gonna introduce you to another friend, uh, Jerry Pellegrino. No, not that Jerry Pellegrino that you may be thinking of. Jerry, uh, this is uh, Jer the son of Jerry Pellegrino, who is a dear friend of, of mine. And uh, Jerry and his wife Erica have launched a new business uh, over in uh, outside of Meridale, uh, Strickland Hollow Distillery. And uh, they have an event planned for next weekend. Uh, for Memorial Day weekend, and we're going to talk a little bit about uh, what they are up to uh, at Strickland Hollow uh, Distillery and, and about that, that event. Well, I guess the big news this week is that we can start, at least those of us who are vaccinated, can start putting away our masks. Um, the Center for Disease Control last week, uh, or was it last week or earlier this week? last week, I think, uh, issued new guidance. Uh, after a few days, the state of New York went ahead and, and agreed with, with that. Uh, the governor's experts uh, said that CDC is, is correct on this. And those who are vaccinated don't need to wear masks, um, they, you know, just to be cautious and maintain some, some distance still, uh, but certainly outdoors and even in a lot of indoor settings, uh, those who uh, have been vaccinated do not need to wear masks. Now, a couple words of, of caution perhaps here. Please, please, please be sensitive to uh, when you walk into, into, a, into one of our local businesses um, as to the 
concerns and desires of the business owner. A lot of businesses and other places are still asking that you that you wear masks, whether or not you've been vaccinated or not. Please don't make a, a fuss about that. Uh, if that's their desire, please do that. And conversely, uh, if if you're not comfortable uh, walking around without a mask, um, by all means, continue to wear a mask. Actually, as I arrived here at the studio, I saw someone drive by. The only person sitting in, a, in the car as they went by was the driver, and that person had a mask on. I'm not sure who they were protecting um, or being protected against, but we all have our own levels of, of comfort obviously. So uh, I think in a lot of ways, our, our, our business owners have been placed in an uncomfortable position uh, where there's, there's really no enforcement. Uh, we're all kind of taking that pinky swear that, that indeed we've, uh, we have been vaccinated and, uh, and feel comfortable walking around outdoors without masks. Uh, it's really not going to be until we have large numbers of a large percentage of folks uh, in the here, at least here in the in our area, uh, vaccinated. That I think uh, we'll probably see a full reopening of our local economy. Speaking of vaccinations, uh, you all know if you've been listening to me for the past few months, uh, we've been very critical of the vaccination effort and the ability of folks to get out and around and, and get those vaccinations. Uh, we, we're, our authorities were, were telling our residents, particularly our elderly residents, that they needed to find a way to get to places like Syracuse or Plattsburgh or Potsdam um, or even Binghamton. And while um, that's fine and a lot of people are mobile, uh, you know, let's face it, um, sometimes a trip from Roxbury to, to Margaretville for a lot of people is a major logistical uh, project. So having uh, more places available, that's all terrific. If you need, if you want a vaccine and you are unable to get there because you have no transportation. Earlier this week, I spoke with the folks at Get There. Uh, it's a project of the uh, Rural Health Network, <clears throat> excuse me, of South Central New York. And they will, they will provide transportation at no cost to you if you need transportation to get to a vaccination site. Call them at 855, that's toll free, 855-373-4040, 855-373-4040, they will arrange transportation for you. Let's talk about what's happening here in the, in the area. Uh, joining me uh, via, via Zoom um, are two folks who are uh, starting a, really spearheading this effort to, to create a, um, to create a uh, Montessori school here in our area. And I'm thrilled to uh, introduce to, to you, David Mady uh, and Sophie Wallace Rasmussen. Uh, guys, can you both hear me? Sophie, I need your microphone on. Yes, I can hear you. There we go, wonderful. Thank you both for joining me this afternoon. <clears throat> uh, so tell, let's start right from the beginning. You know, I'm, I'm familiar with the Montessori idea of, of education. Um, not a lot of people, I suspect, are. Uh, there are a couple Montessori schools. Um, I think there's one in Kingston, one recently started over in Catskill, in the village of Catskill. Um, but for a lot of folks, this is something unknown. So let's talk about what you've done to date uh, and what is a Mont what's the Montessori concept? Well, the Montessori concept is an educational methodology that is based on um, a system that was designed by Dr. Montessori, who's an Italian doctor and professor. And she, back in the 
last century in the 1910s and 20s designed this educational method based on her observations on younger children and how they uh, needed to learn and how they preferred to learn. And her uh, studies led into this method that is now used worldwide. Uh, there's over 20,000 Montessori schools worldwide now and 175 of them are in New York State actually. And so it's actually very successful. And when we were looking at different school methodologies, we landed on Montessori because of its success. And it's a um, very uh, easy adoption into the American educational system. So let's talk about what brought you to this point. Um, you have a couple children who were both enrolled at, at uh, Delhi Central School. And during the, the pandemic, um, they, you, um, well, you tell the story, what happened? Well, first of all, I think we can say that we certainly did not expect to find ourselves as someone starting a school. Um, <clears throat> we're both entrepreneurs. We've had our own businesses um, for forever and uh, some in the field of education, but certainly not children education. But I think <clears throat> what happened to our family is maybe the same as happened to a lot of other families that during COVID, um, you know, for us homeschooling and uh, with all the things that happened, we got a chance to question uh, how we had been doing things. And certainly for us, of course, how uh, we had been dealing with our children's education was very much up front because we had to, or we chose to uh, take the homeschooling in our own hands. So, you know, as much as, you know, COVID had brought about so many bad things, uh, there may also have been some silver linings. And for us, this was the, uh, the inspiration to say, well, maybe it's time that we take a look at alternative options for our own children's education. And that was really triggered by that. So the Montessori mo model, as you mentioned, Sophie, is a very broad one and can be adaptive in, in a lots of different ways. Um, you, David, you mentioned that you and Sophie have both, uh, both entrepreneurs, both have owned several businesses during your lives. Um, what's the focus of, of this curriculum that you're developing? That's a really good question. And one of the things that we um, landed on is because we are part of this amazing county and this beautiful nature that is surrounding us and a very rich farm history. So obviously, the first thing we thought about was how can we uh, marry the Montessori method with what is available in this county? What is it that it offers uniquely here? What is it that it makes this area so special? And so we are focusing on four specific areas for the school curriculum, and they are nature conservation, which we know is a very important part of Delaware County, especially because we're part of the watershed. We are looking at the arts because we have an understanding that there's a lot of creative professionals who live up here, um, painters, uh, you know, uh, artists of various shapes and stripes. Um, and so we wanna support uh, all those families. We are looking at sustainability, both in terms of farming, but overall living, like how can we farm in a sustainable and environmentally great way, excuse me. And finally, we're looking at entrepreneurship. And that is really because as David said, we have been building businesses ourselves and we know the value of <clears throat> being able to be financially independent and support whatever dreams that you want to pursue uh, and employing that idea and that aspect into a children's education we feel is is a really uh, a great asset to this school and to the community's children who probably will end up being the next baker or shop owner or farmer or something of that ilk. So let's talk about what steps you've taken thus far. Yes, I can uh, say a bit about that. Um, it uh, may be the first time ever that someone started a Montessori school in just eight months. Um, so certainly being um, experienced in entrepreneurship have been uh, very helpful. Um, when starting a school, um, and I'm thinking of all the people who are, are running a business who's listening to, these, um, to this program, you can imagine that either you are a teacher, 
and you want to start the business of a school, so you got to find some business people to run the school. In our case, it's been the other way around. We are someone who have some experience in business, but we have to hire people instead who knows about education and so on. We've certainly also taken training ourselves, and Sophie's in the process of getting getting certified by uh, Montessori uh, associations and and so on. But um, we came from it um, as a business. Um, we thought of creating this as a nonprofit. It turns out that in many ways, in terms of getting approval from New York State Education Department and other things, it's actually better to uh, run it as a family-owned uh, business. So that's what we are doing. So the first step um, to start a school is to get a license. Uh, you cannot start a school, you cannot incorporate a company bearing the name school in the name unless you have consent from the governor. So we've been working on this for um, the beginning and we're happy to report that just this week we received uh, a letter of uh, consent. Um, so we now have a license to run the school. The other thing that is important to run a school is parents and families. And we were very fortunate to know already from our friends and our network and the people we have spoken to that there was quite a big interest in an alternative school uh, option. Um, and this is certainly driven by the, the changes in demographics in the area. We ourselves are someone who came from uh, Brooklyn where we lived for 11 years and, and were um, blessed to discover what this county have to offer, but we're certainly not the only ones. And we know also from our dialogue with the Economic Development Office um, in the county that this is certainly a demographic change. So there's a lot of these parents who may already have uh, been attending alternative schools and private schools. And uh, we have already more than uh, 150 on our mailing list, which is one of the things you want to do as a business, that have been uh, interested. And we have letters of intent already from more than 30 families. So that was the second thing that we've done. The next thing is finding a property. This school is going to be on a farm, and we are very far in uh, finalizing the location so that this can be true to what Sophie spoke about, that this is a school focused on uh, farming as part of the curriculum. And then the last building block, which is the one we're working on right now, is to get uh, funding. So we uh, would have no grants from the government. We will have um, no uh, contributions other than what parents will be paying uh, to finance the operations and the teacher salaries and so on. So we're trying to get the funding in place. Um, we're applying for SBA loans, we're working with banks, we're working with uh, different lenders right now to make that work. And that's what's happening right now. And I would say the last thing that is missing for this to be a reality uh, and open up this September. Yeah, you mentioned that you have uh, letters of, of commitment from 30 families. How many, how many children does that represent? That is about uh, 30 children uh, as, okay. uh, as well. In, in fact, it's a little bit fewer families, but, but representing 30 children, okay. which, by the way, uh, Ray, is, is enough. If all those letters of intent would materialize, right. we were good to go. And, and you can imagine when, you know, I'm sure many listeners also have been uh, approaching their banks during these times and have uh, experience in working with banks. And, and banks, of course, when we are a startup with no track record as for this particular business, they like to see that revenue is coming in up front. We're not opening shop and hoping that there will be um, some customers in this business, some parents, some families. Um, we are trying to get as much as we can up front. So if all those letters of intent actually materialize and become parents who will commit, we're good to go. Uh, but we're certainly still looking for more. We know that a letter of intent is not a final commitment and people change their minds and there can be reasons why they cannot attend for, for any reason. So that is one uh, step. Also to further uh, create uh, more attendance on the school, we are also in the process of establishing a scholarship foundation. Because even if this is a private school that, that lives uh, from uh, payments for tuition from parents, we want to make sure that any child in the community, regardless of their financial circumstances, get a chance to join the school. So now that we are this far, uh, a next milestone for us is to establish a scholarship foundation, do events, um, receive donations, and find people in the community who would give donations that would go uh, directly to uh, a contribution so someone could attend the school with a lower tuition fee, a tuition fee that would fit um, their uh, financial capabilities. So those are some of the things that are going on right now. 
what are the ages of the of the of the children that you're talking about? That's a great question. And with all hope, this September we're opening three classrooms, one for toddlers from the uh, ages of 18 months to 36 months, okay. a small classroom for uh, uh, primary kids, which is ages three to six. And then we have an elementary classroom, which is running from six to 12. And I just wanted to clarify, what does this mean? Well, we're actually doing mixed age classrooms. And this is very indicative of the Montessori way. They promote and support the idea of mixed age classrooms for various reasons, one of which is it resembles society. It is, this is what it looks like. And they really want to promote that children like to learn from each other. The olders like to teach the youngers and the youngers aspire to be like the older ones. So this really applies very well um, to what our envision, what we're envisioning in school to be is these mixed age classrooms. However, uh, we do plan in the future to open up more classrooms and run all the way up until the finish of high school, providing students with a high school diploma upon their completion. So this will be a full on integrated school from daycare to high school. You know, Sophie, you're really following a model that until what the mid 19th, uh, mid 20th century, was really the, the standard model of education in the United States with the mixed ages in that one classroom, you know, the old idea of the one room schoolhouse. Absolutely, and we were very inspired by this idea early on. Uh, we have been doing a lot of uh, studying of, on history in this area and, and know that there were tons of them. We have one of the old schoolhouses right down our road that we pass every day. They're beautiful and we love the history that Delaware County has and the US for that matter. We have books about it and we just we just enjoy this, uh, this story so much. And initially when we were thinking about uh, doing a school, we wanted to you know resemble that history. We wanted to bring that history again and Montessori is one way because they support this idea. This is how they think is the, the best way to um, educate children anyway, so that was a really good marriage. Parents, of course, Sir Ray, might be wondering, how can you have a teacher who can teach both a three-year-old and a six-year-old in the same classroom? How is that even possible? But the thing is that uh, one of the core principles in the Montessori school is that children can choose what activities they engage in. And the teacher is a facilitator of that process. So Montessori school classroom are large rooms where there are different sections. That's by the way is why a barn is a perfect location for such a school. So the teacher will go around and assist children as they choose themselves to a certain degree what they want to engage in. And isn't that just, you know, one of the things that defines also entrepreneurship that is driven by passion, it is driven by uh, using your own skills, but also collaborating and I think also as a, as a business person for my own children, that one of the things that happens in the mixed classrooms is that the uh, older children take care or help or assist the younger children that are not yet able to do certain tasks or do not yet have information. This is called leadership. So I think that uh, this model is a great way for the older children to get the chance to be in uh, uh, a leadership position in a helping position. And I think that's a really great thing to, to experience along with the opportunity of, of choosing things. Certainly working in teams, as you said, when you started this program, the idea of collaboration, anybody who has ever been in business knows that this is so fundamental uh, to be successful in, in whatever you do in business and in arts and, and everywhere. So that's why the mixed classrooms is something that we uh, feel very, very strong about. And you know, the, the idea of the older children uh, being those leaders and, and whenever you look to be that model, uh, there, there are some obligations and there's some, some responsibilities that those older children, even if they're six years old, will be, will be learning. So, uh, you know, it's a, it certainly is a, it's a model that, and, and as you said, replicates, kind of replicates uh, life 
in a lot of ways. Very much. If folks want to get involved, either be with their children or help finance, whatever the case may be, how can they find out some more information about what you're doing? Well, the best thing to do is actually go visit our website, which is bovinamontessori.com. And there you can sign up for our email updates, which is a really great uh, source of what the news is. What are we doing right now? You can also find on the website, we have blog posts where we announce what, what is going on right now. So you're updated on all these developments and how we're doing getting towards that um, seminal mark in September where we hope to start the school. Um, and you can also write to us personally if you have questions. Our email is on that website as well. Yeah. And we have people um, signing up for our mailing list. Some of them have, of course, children that are in the school age uh, and who would like us to start uh, as soon as possible. Others sign up on the list if they just want to keep in, in touch and, and some are thinking for the, the following year, maybe. And then we have people without children who would like to support. And we're really thankful for that. They're helping spreading the word. Uh, they are sending around the link uh, to people that, that they know and so on. Also on this program, I want to mention uh, already um, the way forward to make sure that any child in the county, regardless of their financial situation, can join the school is going to depend on scholarships. So if there's any businesses listening to this who would like to give a contribution in any way, by time or monetary or with facilities or equipment or anything at all. We would certainly love to hear from someone who will support this. It's going to be a community effort. It takes a village to raise a child and it also takes a village to raise a school. So we hope for much support from, from across the community. Yeah, and I, I wanna to add to that, that we do have already people who are reaching out who want to collaborate. And for us, it's very important that as David says, this is a community effort. So we are hoping to reach out to local businesses, to local organizations who want to collaborate in some shape or form with the school to support the curriculum, you know, to support the children and or, or maybe even to make community wide uh, projects along with our children in some capacity. We are very open to that idea. We want to engage the local community that we're part of. Well, David Mady and Sophie Wallace Rasmussen, thank you both um, for telling everyone about what you're doing with the Montessori School. Certainly, I wish you great success. So, look, I think we'll have you back every so often on this program and others to uh, give us a bit of an update. You know, it's starting, uh, as you said, starting from 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 scratch to uh, to opening the doors in eight months is ambitious, um, but. Welcome to Delaware County. That's the kind of thing that we get to accomplish uh, in this in this area, and, and that's one of the, really the beauties of of being part of of this really special community. And I welcome both of you to this to this community, and and your contributions I know are going to be significant. So, good luck with that project. Uh, we'll have you back and and get some updates to see what else is see how you're progressing. Thank you very much, Ray. Thanks for having us today. And, and thank you for all the other ways you have already been helping us through this uh, process. Uh, we certainly hope to be a future member of the chamber in the very near future. Wow, we look forward to that as well, don't we? That's <laughs> terrific. <laughs> well, thanks again. Thank you so much. In a few minutes, Jerry Pellegrino with uh, Strickland Hollow is gonna be joining me. Uh, we're going to talk about Strickland Hollow Distillery, I should say, and we're going to be talking about what he's doing over there and uh, some events that are that are coming up. But first, let's take a look at our weather forecast. It is one of this, you know, to think that just a few days ago we were, I still was wearing something of a winter coat um, and trying to convince my wife to turn on the heat inside the house. Mostly sunny skies this afternoon with highs going up to the lower 80s. Yes, I said 80s this afternoon. Overnight tonight, mostly cloudy skies with lows going down to about 59 degrees. And then for let's look at this weekend. For tomorrow, partly sunny skies and a chance of a shower a little bit later on in the afternoon. 
highs tomorrow going up to about 82 degrees. For Saturday night, we have a chance of showers um, earlier on in the evening, about a 30% chance, followed by mostly cloudy skies overnight with a low only going down to about 61 degrees. For Sunday, another warm day on tap. Highs on Sunday going up to about 80 degrees. We have a chance of some thunderstorms a little bit later on in the day, but nothing that's gonna be any kind of washout. So uh, get out there this weekend and explore. Overnight on Sunday, we got a chance of some thunderstorms uh, early on and then a slight chance of showers as we proceed overnight. Waiting for just a couple minutes, waiting for Jerry to come back to come on to the on on the line. And um, let me go back to what I was talking about while I'm waiting for Jerry. Um, what we were talking about a little earlier <clears throat> with the un, unmasking of of New York. Um, the we're following the CDC guidelines here in New York State. That's a great thing to, to hear. And, but I'll, often as I, as I noted, it's, it's really gonna fall onto the, onto the business owners uh, for the enforcement. No one's gonna be standing outside of a business. But if you do see that they have a sign out front that says, please wear a mask, please do so. Don't argue with, with folks. I don't want to sound like a critical school teacher here, but uh, that is, you know, that's that's critical to. It's really uh, important that we respect the the wishes of that of that business owner and uh, make sure that. And make sure that. Uh, we act as, as neighbors, as we will continue to act as, as neighbors. Joining me now, Jerry, is Jerry Pellegrino. If you would unmute yourself there, Jerry. And Jerry and Erica Pellegrino are the uh, owners of uh, Strickland Hollow Distillery, a brand spanking new distillery located along Route 28 in in, in Meridale, but the tasting room is located at the site of, uh, at, at 70 Main Street, the former site of Ray's Fine Wines and Spirits. And a lot of folks who are listening this afternoon uh, certainly remember very fondly uh, Jerry's parents, Jerry and Connie Pellegrino, who for about 25 years operated Ray's Fine Wines. Jerry, thanks for joining me this afternoon. It's good to be here, Ray. The, I'm, I'm having some technical difficulties here at the board, so just bear <laughs> with me a little bit here. Um, Jerry, I wanted to talk first about Strickland Hollow Distillery and what you and your wife, Erica, are, are developing uh, they're along Route 28. Why don't you tell everyone about that? Yeah, certainly. So um, back in 2001, the family bought with what was originally the, the Lyman Strickland's farm, uh, which is an old dairy farm, uh, really with the intention of just sort of making it a, a leisure property. Um, but early on, we, we realized there was some old apple trees and an old orchard in the back that actually sits uh, partly on another piece of property. But um, uh, we realized early on that we were, in, we, we were in the apple. We had some apple, we had some real um, quantity of apples. Um, we, we undertook sort of a renovation of the barn because that was in a little bit of bad shape. Um, and then, you know, decided that what we would do with the apples would, would be not necessarily make and sell cider, um, but make cider and then distill it and try to make um, something as, as close to the traditional French apple brandy, Calvados. Um, you know, but from, from, um, from apples grown right here in, in Marydale. Um, and so I guess in 2016 is when we 
first started that project, we also started planting a, a new orchard. Um, and so on the east end of the property, we have another 320 trees that are uh, just starting to, to produce fruit. Um, and uh, the, the distillery now makes um, two brandies, a pumice brandy and a Calvada style brandy. We make pomo, which is sort of a, a port version of things made with everything apple. Uh, and then uh, the, the latest project is we do make gin now from, uh, we have a lot of old maple trees on the property that we've been tapping. And so we've been using the sap as the sugar source for our gin. So that's, that's what we've been up to for, for basically the last five years. All right, so let me see if I got this straight. You have <laughs> gin, you have a Cavados type of uh, product, an apple brandy. Yeah. And what else have, what, what have I missed there? So then, then the other brandy we make is called pumice brandy. It's, it's actually made from, from the solids. There was, um, and I was talking with Irene Hussey at Wayside like a couple of months ago. There's, if you read some of the old cider books, there's this thing called ciderkin. And it's after they, after they would press the apples and take the juice and make cider, they would take the solids and add water back and grind and crush them again and make sort of like a second press cider. It's what they often gave to the kids because the sugar content was low. And even if it started to turn hard, there wouldn't be a lot of alcohol in it. And so Irene actually made, a, a, I think, an actual version of it last year. And we've been doing it for a while and using it to make what uh, what's called our Cuvée E, which is, which is officially or legally known as a pumice brand. Um, and so those are the two brandies, one from the original first press cider and then one from the solids. And then we make Pomo, which is um, like the current year's fresh juice with last year's spirit added to it to fortify it. So it's a dessert style apple uh, liqueur, I guess is the best way to describe it. Okay. And, and they are available for sale down at 70 Main Street. Yeah, Delaware. so what's great about New York State and this, um, the, we have what's called a New York State Farm Distilling License. That allows us one satellite tasting room uh, through, the, through the license. And so when, uh, this, you know, when Dixie's decided to not renew their lease, um, the space became available. It was just fortuitous to us that we figured, well, we would just take it over uh, and turn it into the tasting room. What's great about the farm license is besides our stuff, um, we can carry anything, beer, wine, cider, spirits, as long as it's made from New York State agriculture. So along with our stuff, there's a quite a cool collection. Erica has done a great job scouring the state for some of the coolest stuff. Um, and, you know, we, we bring in new things basically every week, but, um, Great, great spirits, great liqueurs, great beer, uh, great wine. Um, so it's, it's mentioned cool. some and of it. And also food. Some you know, of we, the places. Yeah, we've got food. From, we got potato chips made from uh, North Fork, Long Island potatoes. We got a Bloody Mary mix made up in the Adirondacks. You know, we obviously have uh, uh, chocolate. Why am I blanking on her name? Right down the street. Uh, the chocolate place. Er, I'll think of it in two minutes. Local chocolates here. We have our chocolate bars in the shop. We just got um, the uh, local Delhi Coffee Brewery. They have their coffee now. So we've got a lot of stuff that's local in all New York. And the beverages as well. I mean, you have a lot of local ciders and, and wines and, and yeah. products there. You know, what's, what's amazing is the, uh, the liquor laws, you know, in New York State, the wine stores can only sell spirits and wine and the grocery and the grocery stores can sell beer and grocery, but no spirits and wine, right? So if you want a gin and tonic, you can get your gin at the, at the liquor store, but you have to go get your tonic at the grocery store. What's cool about the farm distillery license is we can sell it all. So we do have beer. We actually have fever tree tonic. If you want to get a gin, you can buy our gin, or you can buy Arrowwood's gin, or you can buy isolation gin and grab a tonic. Um, and, and go. So it's it, the license that allows us to do a lot of things that just a straight liquor store can't. But you can't come in looking for, you know, Absolute or Jim Bean because everything on the shelf is made from New York State agriculture. Jerry, I, I alluded in, in my introduction 
that 70 Main Street, uh, where Strickland Hollow Tasting Room is lo currently located, uh, is the former site of Ray's Fine Wines that your folks ran for 25 years in Delhi. Uh, but obviously, your background uh, and, and Erica, your wife's background uh, in spirits, isn't just uh, hereditary, if, if, if you will. So <laughs> let's, let's talk a little bit about your background and well, the expertise that you bring. Yeah, well, actually, it was reverse hereditary, let's be honest. <laughs> So, so when I grew up, you know, as an Italian family, we drank wine at every meal, right? But basically for my entire life, what mom and dad drank were jugs of Gallo Hardy Burgundy. Um, and dad, they each had one glass and each of their glasses was like a 32 ounce pop. So they had one glass every night. You know, uh, when I was off starting to get into in the hospitality industry and I told my dad I bought a case of Bordeaux and that there were 12 bottles in a case. He didn't understand how the case could be so big that you could fit 12 <laughs> gallons of wine in a box. Okay? So, so let's be clear, it, it's not, it can't be hereditary. Dad grew into that business just as much as I was growing in to the hospitality business, which, which is always, it's been, it was great to watch him do that. And mom, for sure. Um, Erica and I, my wife and I both come from uh, decades of hospitality uh, experience. I own uh, three restaurants in Baltimore. I currently own a cooking school down here. Um, Erica uh, was uh, in wine sales for many years. She was national rep for uh, a Napa Valley winery, and then she ended up in Manhattan with MS Walker. So yeah, we've been, this has been something, it, th this is the easy part. It's the farming part at, at Strickland Hollow that's become the challenge. It's uh, growing apple trees and uh, managing the farm that's, that's, and then and the distilling, the distilling side of things, I mean, before I was in the restaurant business, I was a scientist at Hopkins Med School. I, so I have a biochemistry and molecular biology background. So I never distilled um, consumable spirits, but bench distillation and fractional distillation is something we did all the time in the lab. So it's been great to carry on my science experience, my chef experience, my hospitality experience into what is now evolving as you know a, a working farm with a distillery and, and sort of products that are coming out um, on all different levels. It's been a great time. So the farm itself at this point is where, where you're actually, where the magic happens, as they say. Uh, it, it's currently not open uh, to, for, for public view, but you have an event coming up. Uh, where people can see that. So let's talk about that a little bit. Yeah, certainly. I mean, uh, the, 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 we, you can uh, have weddings and things at the farm. We're not um, doing uh, open to the public in the distillery in the tasting room just yet. Um, but, but the first event to kick off this season will be on May 30th. Um, it's something that uh, obviously is close to your wheelhouse, uh, your son Dan's book. American Cider, which is an incredible book about uh, what's going on in the world of cider. We thought the best way to kick off the season would be have a book signing, We'd have Dan there to have books. Um, Irene Hussey from Wayside, Brian Linder from Linders, and, uh, and we'll be there pouring their ciders. There's a bunch of other ciders um, that'll be able to be tasted. Um, you know, we're just, it's going to be just a grand old day at the farm. We've got a great band called the Maple Tones providing music for the afternoon. Um, it's going to be on Sunday, May 30th, so the Sunday of uh, Memorial Day weekend, um, and it's just going to be, we're, you know, people are bringing their kids, we're, we just, we want to open the farm and let everybody see what we're doing, let them see the trees, let them see the barn. The barn is a stunning old building that was built around 1872 that we've sort of painstakingly renovated to, to stand for another 150 years. So we just want to invite the community in. Um, it is a paid ticketed event. You grab a ticket on Eventbrite. It allows you to taste eight ciders and get a tasting glass um, and uh, get to see Dan if you need to buy his book. Some people have already come to the store to buy his book. I believe you've got a stack to bring with you for Dan to sign. Um, <laughs> no doubt, no doubt. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we, we plan on using the farm as a place where the community can gather to meet other people in our area who are producing cider, beer, spirits, food, 
products. I mean, it, the, our goal is for that that part of Marydale to become sort of the center of Delaware County to invite everyone to to enjoy. Like you said, it's it's a magical. There's magic happening. It's a magical place. We want to share it with everyone. And part of it is, and part of it is to create community among those producers and and others. Yeah, of course. I mean, I, coming from Baltimore, which is a little you know bigger city. Um, we've always had a community of restaurateurs and chefs, um, at, and, it, and it, it's been around for a while. What's going on up in our area, Delaware County, is still an infant industry, um, and people are still just really focused hard on getting their work done. But as we grow, we want to make sure that um, we build a real strong sort of consortium of everyone up there who's making great things from what's growing around the area. And, and sharing them with the people who are in the area with us. It's important. Jerry, you mentioned that there's gonna be food available on the 30th and uh, you have some local chefs who are gonna be yeah. doing that preparation. You know, so because because of dad, um, very early on, I was forced to be um, uh, involved in the culinary program at SUNY Delhi. I mean, and I, I say forced, maybe coerced or maybe just uh, for, my father rarely told me what to do, but he forcefully asked me many times to do things. You were um, voluntold. Yeah, exactly. Voluntold. I, I've, I've been, I've had that Jerry Pellegrino voluntold uh, experience. <laughs> yeah, you know how he works. I know you do. Um, but yeah, so um, yeah, uh, two of the instructors from college, Chef Somo and Sean, Chef Sean, those guys are going to provide food for purchase. Um, you know, I think they're going to have, if they're, I think there are one or two students around are going to help them. But again, you know, I think it's such a cool resource to have SUNY Delhi with, with probably the best culinary program in the whole SUNY system and arguably one of the best culinary programs in the state. Um, have them, you know, as, as partners with what we do at the farm. Um, it, it's, it's really, it's really a cool experience. Well, it really is part of that, you know, building that community that we talked about. So it's academic, it's, it's businesses, yeah. it's individuals, it's sharing our passion. That's right. And, you know, as, as um, Delhi grows and as the area grows, and Lord knows since COVID it's growing, um, you know, there's an opportunity to, to do events like this, to get everyone who maybe is new to the area to come and really experience what the area is all about. So Jerry, tell again, uh, this is next Sunday, the 30th. Yeah, so Sunday, May 30th, it's going to start at noon. Uh, tickets are $25. They're, you get them through Eventbrite. Um, but what you'll, what the easiest way to do is just go to our website, which is stricklandhollowfarm.com. Um, you'll find a place to click to buy tickets. Uh, you'll buy tickets in advance. Like I said, with the ticket price comes uh, eight two-ounce tastes of all the ciders we're pouring. Uh, you also get a commemorative glass you know, that you'll use to carry around to do all this tasting, um, the band, uh, the afternoon, um, and, and you'll be able to buy bottles of cider. Westkill Brewery will be there if you're a beer fan. You can grab some beers. You can uh, sit at a picnic table. You can bring a blanket, bring the kids. Um, the Maple Tones is a great band. They're a duet. They, they make some great music. Um, you know, Lord willing, the sun will be shining. Um, uh, otherwise, it'll just be like a mud fest. But you know how Delaware County is. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's in May, so it could be either one. Yeah, it could be minus 12 or 90. That's exactly right. That's yeah. exactly right. Uh, you know, Terry, we got a few minutes, and I really want to explore a little bit more about what, um, you know, what brought you and Erica uh, to this idea of, of distillation. Now, you said that you uh, were down at Johns Hopkins uh, in the med school, and uh, that certainly your biochemistry background and that of Erica's, actually. Yeah, yeah. She, uh, was a, she was a microbiologist in Australia. It's just fascinating. You know, I, I, I meet a lot of business owners, as you can imagine, and, and those folks who are in uh, the hospitality, their backgrounds are just, just fascinating. And you and Erica certainly fall into that category. Um, what's, you talked about only three restaurants. You have a school right now down in Baltimore. You're in Baltimore right now. You still have kind of a foot 
if you will, or maybe just a toe or two yeah. left there in Baltimore. Um, you know, your folks have been up here full time for, you know, mom's been up here for about 30 years. So certainly you didn't grow up here. What's been that transition for you? And especially for Erica coming, growing up in Australia, living and working in places like New York and Baltimore uh, to making that commitment to living full time here in Delaware County. I mean, I don't have to tell anyone who lives up here. It's basically God's country. There's, it's so beautiful. It's so lovely. And the people are great. I mean, you know, my folks found their way up here from Westchester County. That's where we grew up in. The, the home in which they live was originally purchased as a weekend house. Um, and then when dad and mom were ready to, basically Diane and I moved away. My sister and I moved away. They were living in Westchester and they decided to sell that house and come up here permanently. And that's when they took over Ray's. Um, you know, back then they were worried about the image of city people coming into a, a small community. So that's why they chose to left, leave the name of the store Ray's. You know, they didn't want to come in and rock the boat. And, and quite frankly, you know, even when my dad passed away, you know, 25 years later, there are some people who still thought his name was Ray. Um, and, you know, he never corrected them. If they came in and said, hi, Ray, he said, hi, back, you know. Um, and I would often call Jerry. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. I love, I love being up in the Catskills. I love uh, the farm in which we live. And um, I was a little worried about Erica. She's certainly a city girl. But now, now she won't even come back to Baltimore. She stays there with the dogs, stent, kicks me out the door, and sends, tells me to get the work done in Baltimore. Um, you know, it's not it, – and all of our friends who come up, and we have lots of visitors – uh, they they don't want to leave. They realize, you know, what a group, a great part of the world it is uh, to be. And so, it's not hard to be convinced to want to stay up here. In terms of being distillers, uh, in the in these in in the world in which you choose career paths, the best ones you choose are the ones that find you, not the ones that you find. And finding all these apple trees and having to do something with them forced us it forced it found us and, and making making something out of what you grow on your property i'm not sure there's anything more fulfilling than that i mean it's uh it's an amazing uh, path to go from the start of to watch these trees grow and to harvest these apples and then to turn them into something it's you know it for me it's the best thing i've ever done so i you know we're really excited to be here for a long time well, we certainly, we certainly wish you that you're going to be here for a long time. Yeah, well, um, we will. Uh, God willing, I'll, we'll be able to hold, we'll be able to run the store for another 25 years. So we're looking forward to it. How has been that reaction to, to the store uh, there well, in it's Delhi? Great. No, it's great. I mean, you know, I find it very interesting. New Yorkers are really proud of New York stuff. Um, I, I can tell you the Maryland wine industry suffers a little bit because there's not a lot of Maryland pride in Maryland product. But in New York, like if it's from New York, New Yorkers love it. I mean, we get a lot of city folk and they're like, this stuff's all New York. And they're like, we're taking it all back to, to New York City. You know, New Yorkers are really proud of New York. I mean, look at all the great programs. The I love New York, the Taste of New York. You know, it's a, it's a state that supports the state. And um being a store that's all New York, I mean, it's just, it can't get any better than that. And the stuff that we have is amazing. I mean, the, the wines, the spirits, they, they, they will rival anyone's in the country and in the world. It's, it's not that we're forced to sell stuff from New York and we dread selling it every day. We're so proud of all the stuff we have in store and what the people make. It's amazing. Yeah, it is. It's terrific stuff. You really yeah. have some great stuff there. Well, Jerry Pellegrino, thank you for joining me this afternoon. Thank you for um, having me. Are you kidding me? Well, let's, you know, let's tell folks again. Uh, you have an event next Sunday uh, on the 30th at Strickland Hollow. What's the address and what's the time? We're at 9483 Highway 28. Um, we're the big dairy barn with the red metal roof right on 28, right as you come through town. Uh, it'll start at noon. Uh, you'll go to the website, stricklandhollowfarm.com, and grab a ticket. And um, 
hopefully, you know, we'll see you there. It'll be uh, like a, a family, fun, friends, uh, just a real, a real great way to spend a day on a farm. And also just stop, and tickets are certainly available as well over at the store, I, I presume? If you go to the store, we'll get you online. You can buy a ticket right on the POS machine. Okay, wondering. terrific. Yeah, for sure. It's great. Well, we're looking yeah. forward to a beautiful day. Imagine if it's a day like today. That oh, would be so. that would be pretty tremendous. Yeah. And uh, Eric is at the store right now. If you need to go buy some booze, <laughs> <laughs> and we are heard right here. We are heard in Delhi. So uh, there you go. Just stop over and 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 see Erica. Jerry, thanks for joining me this afternoon, and we wish you great success with the program next week and and continued success on Main Street in Delhi. Having you know having an active business there. Uh, in that storefront is is always important. Well, and now we have a beautifully smooth road upon which to drive to. New paint and everything. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jerry. See you soon. You can't, Ray. Well, we'll see you on Sunday. <laughs> yes, yes. Count on it. Bye-bye. <laughs> and thank you for joining us this afternoon, joining me here this afternoon on WIOX uh, Community Radio at 91.3 FM. Uh, we've been talking with the folks from uh, who are starting the Montessori School in, in Bovina, as well as uh, Jerry Pellegrino with Strickland uh, Hollow Farm uh, Distillery, and really fascinating, fascinating program, I think. Um, and, and if in case you missed a part of the program, uh, you can go to the Chamber's YouTube channel, where a recording of, of today's program will be available to you. Uh, as well, if you're listening and you're on the Delhi cable system, uh, the program will be rebroadcast on their local one uh, television channel if you have Delhi telephone. Thanks for joining me this afternoon. Um, not sure who's up next for the program, but I know we'll have something entertaining here for you. So um, as for me, I'll be back in a couple weeks with a new edition of Catskills Commerce. Thank you.